Good afternoon, Benjamin I. Fuchs here, Pharmacist Ben, formulator of True Skin Health Products. And today I wanna to do a Facebook Live and talk about everybody's favorite skin dysfunction, or one of our favorite skin dysfunctions, and that's melasma, or hyperpigmentation. About 1% of the population suffers from hyperpigmentation, but you wouldn't know it based on all of the topical products that are available and all of the strategies that are available and all the noise that you hear about hyperpigmentation and treating dark spots uh, or melasma. So a couple things, hi everybody. Hi Brian, uh, Bryn, hello Maru and Linda. And uh, how you guys doing? Nice to see everybody today. Um, so yeah, last week we did a Facebook Live and I told you I would talk about melasma, hyperpigmentation. Melasma is bas basically the technical name for blotchy skin, hyperpigmentation. And there is, hey Peg, nice to see you. There's so much craziness and mythology out there about pigmentation that I thought I'd clear some of it, some of it up and help folks who are dealing with this, uh, this really not tremendously dangerous problem, not really a... Uh, a significant health challenge, but it can be troubling and it can be very uh, cosmetically unappealing for some folks. So here's the deal on melasma. Most importantly, it is not a skin problem. And this is true about all skin issues, or most skin issues, we'll say, the vast majority of skin issues, psoriasis, eczema, acne, they all uh, begin inside the body. They are systemic issues, they're internal issues. And the reason this is so important is because number one, we see things on the outside of our body, we see, th see things on the skin, and so it just makes sense, well, I'm just gonna treat it by treating my skin. And then on top of that, there's all kinds of inducements to treat our topical or dermatological problems using uh, topical strategies. There's commercials, there's dermatologists, there's products. Uh, it just seems like it's common sense if you got something on the skin to just treat the skin. But it doesn't work because the problem most of the time when you have melasma or any other skin problem begins inside the body. So what's the deal with melasma, hyperpigmentation? First of all, it's not a topical problem, it begins internally. Most importantly, it involves hormones. No surprise there because everything involves hormones. Melasma specifically involves steroid hormones. Interestingly, hyperpigmentation or pigmentation in general is part of the body's stress response. It's one of the ways the body generically responds to stresses. So when we're under duress, we'll secrete hormones, and those hormones will uh, result, the secretion of those hormones will result in a, ma uh, a, 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 a constellation of symptoms. High blood pressure, or elevated blood pressure, pupil dilation, um, elevated heart rate, uh, suppressed immunity, uh, uh, suppressed digestive functioning, constipation, uh, there's all kinds of uh, symptoms that are associated with this stress response, and one of those symptoms is pigmentation. If you learn nothing else from this little Facebook Live that, we do, that we're doing today, please understand that pigmentation in general is part of the stress response, and hyperpigmentation, excessive pigmentation, melasma, inappropriate pigmentation, is one of the ways the body responds to constant secretion or chronic secretion of stress hormones, specifically cortisol, also adrenaline, and estrogen. Even serotonin, which isn't really a stress hormone, but more like a day-to-day uh, uh, a, uh, -day management hormone, even elevated serotonin can be associated with melasma. But most, most, uh, most dramatically or most prominently, it's going to be estrogen and cortisol and perhaps uh, adrenaline. Adrenal fatigue issues are also associated with melasma, and there's a disease called Addison's disease, which is marked by insufficient adrenal functioning, and that's one of the classic symptoms of Addison's disease is hyperpigmentation. So please understand the stress response and pigmentation or hyperpigmentation go hand in hand. So why is this important? Well, if you have pigmentation, you've got a stress issue. And when I say stress, by the way, I'm not just talking about psychological duress. I'm also talking about physiologic stresses as well. And insulin resistance is one of the, or insulin problems, insulin resistance type two diabetes is also associated with, with pigmentation. So if you're dealing with hyperpigmentation, it's not going to be, you're not gonna be able to address it effectively topically You've got to work internally, most especially with the stress response and with stress hormones, eliminating stressors and stabilizing stress hormones. Here's something really interesting for you. The uh, biochemical pathway that produces melanin also is involved with producing adrenaline. 
That is the classic emergency hormone. That's not even a stress hormone. That's an emergency hormone. And in fact, adrenaline can actually get turned into melanin or, pigmenta- uh, or pigmenting uh, or the, uh, biological pigment. Just started. Awesome, May. Glad to hear that. All right, I'll, I'll answer your questions here. If you have questions, just type them uh, into, the, uh, into Facebook and I'll, uh, I'll answer them when I'm done with my talk here. So most importantly, melasma is not a topical problem. It's an internal problem. It usually involves stress hormones and the stress response. That means deal with your stress hormones and deal with the stress response. So let's talk about this a little bit specifically. Most, most dramatically, uh, is the, uh, the hormone estrogen is involved with pigmentation or melasma. And women who, get, uh, who are, are on the birth control pill or who are on hormone replacement therapy or who uh, are pregnant know good and well that all of these situations can result in pigmentation. That's because of the hormone estrogen. Now, it's not exactly estrogen, but it's a breakdown product of estrogen. And I'm not going to talk about this too much today. Maybe we'll talk about it on another Facebook. But estrogen, female hormone, men make it as well, but it's a feminizing hormone. Uh, It gets a lot of bad press. It's associated with cancers and autoimmune diseases and depression and weight gain. But it's not really estrogen as much as it's a metabolite of estrogen. That is a breakdown product of estrogen called catechol estrogen, C-A-T-E-C-H-O-L. Catechol is a, a, a biochemical structure that when it's, when it's attached to things, it makes them much more active. Catechol amines are uh, very active hormones that, that give you energy. Adrenaline is an example of a catechol amine. And when you take these catechol ring and stick it on estrogen, it becomes super estrogen. Why is this important? Well, catechol estrogens accumulate when we don't eliminate estrogen properly, when we don't detoxify estrogen properly. And if these catechol estrogens are associated with pigmentation, now you know that uh, difficulties eliminating estrogen, I'll talk about how that happens in a moment, and difficulties metabolizing or break de- or, or detoxifying estrogen can ac- cause the accumulation of these potent estrogens. And not only can this cause problems with hyperpigmentation, but it can also cause breast cancer, ovarian cancer, PMS, and reproductive health issues, endometriosis, fibromyalgia, a really long list of awful health challenges are associated with improper detoxification or incomplete, I should say detoxification of estrogen and a buildup of these catechol estrogens. If you think this is a lot of biochemistry, I'm sorry, you know, I don't mean to be all wonky and sciencey here, but it's really important to understand if you have melasma that you can't just put a cream on and have it disappear. Even though that's what you're going to hear from practitioners of the of the standard medical model, or even health, uh, even alternative practitioners, or even estheticians. Oh, use this hydroquinone. Oh, use this retinoic acid. What can I put on my melasma? Well, you know there are topical strategies, which I'll talk about here in a second. But if you have an estrogen imbalance, if you're not clearing your estrogen, your melasma is coming back. And what are you going to do? Use hydroquinone the rest of your life. Use skin lighteners for the rest of your life. It's much better, number one, to take care of it at the root at the root cause, which is the estrogen issue, which is in this case with estrogen. And also, you can save yourself uh, further problems with uh, female health issues, God forbid, cancers or other health challenges that these catechol estrogens can cause later on down the road if you really take care of it at the root level. So, why is it that estrogen builds up? Well, number one, or catechol estrogens accumulate. Number one digestion and elimination. Estrogen is eliminated through the bowels. If you're chronically constipated, your catechol estrogens are going to build up and that's going to increase the likelihood of hyperpigmentation or melasma. Yes, your bowel movements are related to your dark spots and you're not going to hear that and you don't hear that very often from uh, ordinary skincare professionals or on the internet. So it's really important to understand the systemic connection with melasma, especially when it comes to digestive health and the elimination of estrogen. Also, liver problems can do it because the liver is associated with or is responsible for the breakdown of estrogen. And when you have liver issues and some 100 million Americans have issues with fatty liver disease, estrogen is, catechol estrogens are also likely to build up. So you got to work on the liver. The liver is impacted by blood sugar. And insulin. So if you're type one di- have type one diabetes or insulin resistance, that can also cause these issues with catechol estrogens. I could go on and on and on about all the different ways that the uh, systemic or biochemical dysfunction can lead to the accumulation of catechol estrogens and lead to melasma. But the point is, it's not a skin problem; it's an internal problem. It usually involves stress, and it especially involves stress hormones like estrogen 
or the catechol estrogens. Now cortisol, which is obviously, most of you guys know that it's a stress hormone, that can also cause pigmentation, elevated cortisol levels. So if you're under chronic stress and your cortisol is high, You'll know your cortisol is high if you have insomnia, if you have problems, if you uh, uh, go to wake up in the middle of the night and have problems going back to sleep, if you have what's called postural hypotension, where you bend down and stand up and you feel really dizzy or woozy, if you crave salt, if you have chronically elevated blood pressure, all of these can be signs of high cortisol, and that can also lead to melasma. So what do you do there? Well, you gotta relax, and there's also nutritional supplements that you can take. Uh, uh, blood sugar problems can also cause elevated cortisol, so you gotta work on your blood sugar. Can you see how there's all of these different internal strategies that you have to employ if you really wanna take care of your melasma effectively and permanently, and not only that, prevent further problems down the road. Uh, also, there's medications that can do it, um, most especially uh, birth control pills, uh, hormone replacement therapy, SSRIs, ser uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac or Effexor, they can cause hyperpigmentation as well. There are some antibiotics that can cause pigmentation issues. Um, and then, uh, let's see, there's something else I was gonna tell you. Uh, insulin resistance, oh, here's another one. Nutritional deficiencies that are caused by leaky gut. So for example, if you have a leaky gut or you have stomach problems, you may not be absorbing your vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 deficiencies can cause hyperpigmentation. If you have an intestinal problem, you may not be absorbing your zinc. Or if you have a bile problem, if, you're, if you had your gallbladder removed, you may not be absorbing your zinc. Zinc deficiencies can also cause issues with estrogen and then ultimately with pigmentation. So there's all kinds of things that are responsible for hyperpigmentation that have nothing to do with the sun. So wear all the sunscreen you want, and you know my take on sunscreen. Some of you guys know my take. Hi, Megan. Some of you guys know my take on sunscreens. But if you have these internal problems, you're still gonna be pigmenting. So what do you do? All right, so first of all, if you're pigmenting, number one, most importantly, work on estrogen. Use progesterone cream or progesterone serum. I make a progesterone serum. I know some of you guys have asked about it. Um, it's not ready for sale yet, although we're kind of sampling it out, and I'll... Uh, if you send me a note, uh, if you're interested in my progesterone serum, send a note to support at truthtreatments.com and I'll let you know when it's ready to go. Um, so you can work on your estrogen with progesterone. You can also use essential fatty acids, EFAs. Essential fatty acids are very important for estrogen metabolism. They're also the molecules of inflammation and anti-inflammation. And by the way, I didn't mention this, but infl inflammatory issues like post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation after you get a cut or after you get a wound, that can also induce pigmentation if you're destabilized internally. So uh, using essential fatty acid supplements can help minimize the likelihood of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Uh, and then working on digestive health, obviously, always want to work on digestive health using probiotics. Probiotics can also help you with estrogen and estrogen metabolism. And then working on uh, the health of the gallbladder and fat absorption using lecithin granules, digestive enzymes, bile salts, and also perhaps digestive enzymes, especially something called lipase. And this is all in the name of reducing estrogen to reduce your, uh, reduce your melasma. And when it comes to cortisol, the most important thing, you, well, the two most important things you, you can do to lower cortisol is relax. Relax your body. Relax your body using deep breathing techniques. I love an app called uh, Breathing Zone, which you can get on your iPhone, and that can walk you through slow deep breathing techniques, and that can have a great cortisol lowering effect. And then keeping your blood sugar stable, not only will it lower your cortisol, will help stabilize your cortisol if you keep your blood sugar stable, keep it, keep, uh, the high blood sugar, low blood sugar roller coaster from, from kicking in. That's when you eat sugar and your blood sugar goes up and then your insulin kicks in and your blood sugar goes down. You eat more sugar and your blood sugar goes up and your insulin kick, kicks in and your blood sugar goes down. I call that the high blood sugar, low blood sugar roller coaster. By stabilizing your blood sugar by calorie restriction, using nutritional supplements like the B vitamins and chromium and zinc, and of course, going ketogenic or at least re uh, reducing your intake of carbs. By the way, protein will also spike your blood sugar and can also cause problems with, um, with cortisol via this high blood sugar, low blood sugar roller coaster. So it's not just carbs, it's also protein. So keeping your blood sugar stable is also important in addition to slow, deep breathing. Those are probably the two most important strategies for stabilizing your cortisol. You can use things like muscle relaxation strategies, massage is great, using hot water, immersion in hot water, uh, baths, 
Uh, even just throwing hot water, or should say warm water, not hot water, warm water on your face can have a cortisol lowering effect. So lowering your cortisol is another very important strategy in addition to lowering your estrogen, uh, or at least stabilizing your estrogen and, and uh, keeping those catechol estrogens from accumulating. Then topically, there are things you can do topically, but if you don't take care of your estrogen, you don't take care of your cortisol, you don't take care of your insulin and insulin resistance issues, you don't take care of your digestive health problems and your nutritional deficiencies, topical strategies are only going to be affected at best temporarily and your melasma is going to come back. So. Uh, what can you do, do topically once you've met all your, uh, once you've taken care of all of the internal needs? Uh, there's lots you could do. Alpha hydroxy acids and beta hydroxy acids, glycolic acid and salicylic acid are great. If you go get a prescription, you're probably going to get something called hydroquinone, which is really nasty stuff. It does work, um, you, but it's super, super toxic. Uh, if, I should say, I don't say super toxic, but if you ate it, it would be super toxic. Topically, it's so toxic that you could only use it for three weeks, to, uh, three to six weeks at a time, and then you have to stop using hydroquinone because hydroquinone can permanently disable the cells that make melanin, in, in which case you'll end up with white spots, which is not a good thing either. So you got to be really careful with hydroquinone, even though it's effective. As effective as hydroquinone, but with less toxicity, with much less toxicity, is retinol, which I absolutely love as a skin lightening, uh, skin lightening agent. Um, you can use retinol uh, much more frequently than you can use hydroquinone. You can use retinol long term. And of course, as most of you guys know, retinol also has wonderful anti-aging effects and will help thicken your stratum corneum, uh, thicken your epidermis. Uh, it will strengthen your stratum corneum. It will also help you produce collagen, so you get a nice strong dermis as well. It's just a wonderful, it's, next to vitamin C, I consider it to be the most important anti-aging topical. Now, here's the one thing you want to know about peels and alpha hydroxy acids and beta hydroxy acids. If you, and by the way, salicylic acid is a synonym for beta hydroxy acids. Um, if you are destabilized, if you're making these catechol estrogens or elevated cortisol, you have these internal problems or you're on prescription, uh, prescription estrogen hormone replacement therapy and you try to get skin peels or even laser, some people will use lasers to get rid of hyperpigmentation, it can cause a rebound pigmentation. It can actually induce more hyperpigmentation. And there's a lot of people who will go to an esthetician or a dermatologist for their hyperpigmentation spots, for their melasma spots, and they'll get a peel or they get laser, and they'll end up with more hyperpigmentation, and obviously they won't be very happy. So if that is you, if you're going to get peels for your hyperpigmentation, it's really important that you take care of all of the internal causes of the melasma as you're going to the doctor, as you're going to the esthetician or to the dermatologist and getting your treatments, your topical treatments done. Otherwise, you run the risk of getting, uh, of causing more pigmentation by using the treatments that you're, that you're using to get rid of the pigmentation, which is obviously not a good thing. All right, so I hope that's not too confusing. The most important take home message is melasma is not topical, even though it appears on the skin, it starts inside the body. It's most uh, importantly associated with the stress response and associated stress hormones, cortisol, estrogen, and adrenaline. And also it's linked to things like nutritional deficiencies, as well as digestive problems, and also insulin resistance. And of course, issues metabolizing or breaking down estrogen completely, including liver problems and bowel problems. Topically, there are things you could do, but if you don't take care of the internal causes of melasma, your melasma is going to come back. The best all time, best, in my opinion, best topical strategies for getting rid of melasma are alpha hydroxy acids, retinol, and also, I didn't mention this, vitamin C, which is a great skin lightener. Uh, and also, of course, as we all know, it's also a great anti-aging ingredient. All right, so hopefully that clears up melasma. I was gonna talk about essential fatty acids, but I'm gonna leave that for next week. There's a lot of confusion about essential fatty acids as well. I'll talk about that next on our next Facebook Live, and let's see if we've got questions here. Uh, bump, bump, bump. Hi, Stephanie, good to see you as well, even though I can't see you, see your name. Uh, let's see, how about, uh, let's see here, got a question. How about in colored skin with acne? Does, 
Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. These are all, I don't know what you mean by color skin. I, su I assume you mean darker skin types. And yes, all of these strategies I talked about are important for darker skin types. In fact, people who are right in the middle of what's called the Fitzpatrick scale, which is a measurement of the uh, Fitzpatrick scale measures how light skin is compared to how dark skin is. Light skin is uh, on one end of the scale. Dark skin is on the other end of the scale. The middle of the Fitzpatrick scale is where you get hyperpigmentation. Those are the people who will pigment. And if you are breaking out, if you get zits, acne, pimples, and then when the pimples resolve, you get pigmentation. That's called PIH or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And you can rest assured you either have an estrogen issue, a cortisol issue, an insulin resistance issue, a nutritional defici deficiency issue, a problem clearing out estrogen, all the things we just talked about. So yes, everything I talked about is applicable to people who have middle of the Fitzpatrick scale type skin and who are dealing with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And May says she just started using the Truth Trifecta for a couple of weeks and your skin has been so radiant. Awesome, good deal, May. We hear that a lot. Uh, yes, uh, this is a great question. Claire asked about ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is a stress management herb. A lot of plants, in fact, phytonutrients, plant nutrients, phytonutrients is the technical name for plant nutrients, have this ability to help cells, biological cells, adjust or adapt to stresses. And this is one of the major roles of these phytonutrients. In fact, it is the major role of phytonutrients or plant nutrients. Ashwagandha has a lot of these phytonutrients, but all herbs, all botanicals, in fact, all plant material contains these phytonutrients. It's not like ashwagandha is the uh, holy grail of stress management herbs, even though it gets a lot of, it's marketed as such. These stress management molecules, these phytonutrients that are found in botanicals, like ashwagandha, are said to be adaptogenic. Adaptogens are molecules that help cells adapt to stresses. So yes, adaptogenic herbs, all herbs, botanicals, ashwagandha, adaptogenic molecules can definitely help with stress, but as long as you have your insulin or blood sugar problems, as long as you have your psychological duress problems, as long as you have your digestive health issues or whatever is causing the duress, it's not like the ashwagandha is gonna eliminate the stress, although it may help the bi your biological cells adapt or adjust to that stress. So it's not a bad thing, but it's not, exact, it's not gonna totally reverse the stress response. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Lots of people watching, no questions. Ah, DIM. Claire asked about DIM. DIM is very interesting. I was one of the first, in fact, I was the first guy to work with DIM. When I had my pharmacy in Boulder, DIM was actually uh, invented, not invented, but first synthesized. It's found in broccoli and in uh, cruciferous vegetables, but it was isolated by a physician who lived in Boulder. And when he was isolating it back in the 90s, when he first isolated it in the 90s, DIM stands for methane. Uh, he, was, he was selling it to uh, supplement companies to use as an estrogen balancer, but he wanted me to make skincare products with it. And I started playing with it, but it, it's not a very stable molecule, so you won't see it in very many. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to keep it stable, so I, I didn't end up working with it, and it's not found in, I don't know of any skin, skin products that have DIM in it because it is so unstable. But you can take it orally, and DIM, along with another molecule that's found in cruciferous vegetables called I3C, indole 3 carbonyl is also, uh, along with DIM, is also marketed, and it also helps you, uh, not to market it, it actually does help you uh, metabolize estrogen. It helps you process estrogen. But the doses you get are very, very small, and you're not really gonna get much benefit. And I don't know a lot of people who get a tremendous amount of benefit from DIM or I3C, although it can help. Much better is eat broccoli and eat cauliflower and cabbage and Brussels sprouts and the cruciferous vegetables, which are not only loaded with DIM and I3C, but they also have other molecules that can help stabilize estrogen and also that can help improve liver detoxification. So much better to eat your cruciferous vegetables than try to supplement with DIM or I3C, although they, won't, they certainly won't hurt. Thanks for that question, Claire. I hope that helps. Uh, let's see here. Shoshana Martinez, Kaplan, cool name. Prevent, uh, preventive options in general are not an emphasis these, oh, okay. Yes, you're right. Are you a healthcare professional, Shoshana? It sounds like you know some stuff there. Megan, hello, Megan and May. I just ordered energy. Uh, yes, Sandra. Oh, Sandra asked about the energy device and lymphedema. It may help a little bit, but lymphedema is a serious condition that you really wanna take care of. The lymphatic system is a circulatory system for fluids, not for blood, but for, uh, for toxins and also for fatty nutrients. 
And when the lymphatic system is stagnant or clogged from toxicity, it will, uh, fluids won't move as effectively and the fluids can leak out of the lymph and that can cause, leak into the tissues out of the lymph and that can cause this condition called lymphedema, which is very uh, unpleasant, but it's also very dangerous in the sense that you're not gonna be eliminating toxins as effectively. The best strategy for lymphedema is to move your body, number one, because the lymph requires movement, muscular movement, in order to have its, its uh, in order to propel the fluids through it. The heart, ha the, uh, the blood has a heart to pump so fluids go through the bloodstream through the pumping action of the heart, but the lymph doesn't have a pump like the heart. There's no heart in the lymph. So the lymph depends on our muscular movement in order to propel fluids through it. Uh, and that requires exercise, walking, hanging upside down on an inversion device, jumping up and down on a rebounder. Also, of course, eliminating toxicity. And the most likely cause of toxicity into the lymph is of course, intestinal issues, especially uh, fatty uh, problems metabolizing fats because the lymph transports fats. So work on fat metabolism, work on digestive issues and move that lymph by moving your muscles. Slow deep breathing, by the way, is another great strategy for moving the lymph. And by deep, I mean all the way down in the belly where your belly goes out and then comes back in, belly breathing. Breathing is an amazingly helpful strategy. Hello, Kristen, nice to see you uh, and Dawn Marie. Uh, and as far as the energy device, I guess I didn't answer that. The energy device probably won't move your lymph, but it will move the muscles under your skin. It might have a small effect on the lymphatic fluids in the skin. Love retinol too. What supplements do I recommend daily? Jerry, you're kidding. There's so many. There's so many. And you're not going to get it from a multiple vitamin. Uh, but it's really, I take about 40 different supplements every day. I don't even know how many. And some of them I take three or four of each. So I take probably 100, over 100 pills a day. But you gotta do it strategically, and it's very difficult to do. I was kidding last time we did a Facebook. I said I was, I was gonna, and I'm not kidding, I'm kinda serious. I wanna go to Vitamin Cottage and, and walk around with folks and show them what to buy, because it is confusing to know what to buy. Some of the really important ones, must-haves, vitamin C, zinc, magnesium. Um, those are the three ones that stand out, but there's so many more. I hate to pick on, on just one or two. I love N-acetylcysteine, which is now going to become uh, hard to find. It's not totally banned yet, but it may be banned. Coenzyme Q10, essential fatty acids. There's so many really important ones. It's hard to say which supplements do I recommend, but those are some of the important ones. Uh, let's see. I don't have a digestive enzyme coming out, Megan. There are a lot of them. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate that about our blemish repair and collagen. Thank you for all the kind words. I appreciate that. I don't really see any questions here. Someone told me melanin is different. I don't know what that means. Salud, belaza y astio de vida. I don't know what that means. Someone told me melanin is different. If you want to send a, a, send a message here uh, before we leave, I'll answer that. Uh, Omega-6 healing cream is awesome, isn't it? Somebody asked me, I did a Zoom earlier this week, and they said, what is your favorite product that you ever developed? And without even thinking twice, I said, Omega-6 healing cream it is absolutely the most important and my favorite product of all the products I've developed. And I've probably developed over a thousand products in the last uh, 35 years, but by far and away the most important and my favorite, my baby, is Truth Omega-6 Healing Cream, which is a multi-functional topical product for healing burns or any kind of abrasions, as well as for moisturizing and softening the skin. It's a healing product and the best skin moisturizer, skin softener you'll ever use. I don't really like the term moisturizer, that's sort of a misleading word, but skin softener you'll ever use. Thanks for pointing that out, Maritza, I appreciate that. Uh, what are your thoughts on eating things like liver, spleen? Yes, uh, that's a great question. Megan asked about eating liver and spleen and brain and heart. You didn't mention that in kidney. Those are called organ meats and they are the best part of an animal. Like, I think they call them awful, O-F-F-A-L, not A-W-F-U-L. Even though the, the thought of it is kind of awful. Uh, technically, they're called awful, O-F-F-A-L. And those are by far and away the healthiest of all the uh, parts of the animal that you're eating. They're loaded with nutrients. Think about it. The organs are doing all this work. So the vitamins and the minerals, vitamins and minerals help the organs do work. So the vitamins and minerals in the animal concentrate in the organs and the fats concentrate in the organs, the good fats. So organ meats are the best of all meats to eat. The desiccated supplements, um, they're not as, uh, you know, you're not getting much 
much, uh, pr uh, much meat or much organ in the desiccated supplements. Look at how big a supplement is. You're getting like 200 milligrams, which is like you know, a pinch of that liver or that spleen. So they're okay, but much better to eat the, if you eat meat, you know, much better to eat the organ meat than to try to use the supplements. Thank you, Claire. I hope that, I'm glad that made sense. Uh, how did you, oh, thyroid, Dawn Marie, good question. The thyroid affects everything, absolutely everything. In fact, uh, all, dis all chronic diseases, all misery, anything that has to do with the body that's not pleasant, that's a disease or a sickness or some kind of physiologic malfunction involves the, th the thyroid. The thyroid controls all of the cells of the body. The thyroid is like the carburetor for all of this, for the body's energy. It directs energy to the cells. When the thyroid doesn't function, the, uh, doesn't function well, none of the other organs will function, none of the other cells and none of the other, none of the other organs will function well either. So yes, hyperpigmentation definitely can involve a poorly functioning thyroid. The adre there's an important relationship between the adrenal glands and the thyroid. This is called the adrenal thyroid axis. And when you're hyperadrenal, you're under a lot of stress, your adrenal glands are your stress glands, and when you're under a lot of stress, you're hyperadrenal, eventually the thyroid will start to slow down. And one of the causes of hypothyroidism is elevated adrenal function or too hyperadrenal function. So calming down is one of the best strategies. All the things we talked about for relaxing the body are one of the best strategies for, uh, for improving thyroid function. Also, the major cause of hypothyroidism is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Probably 80 or 90% of hypothyroid patients are dealing with Hashimoto's disease, as they call it. And Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease. And guess what the cause of autoimmune diseases is? is digestive health. What's worse, check this out, uh, Autoimmune diseases are caused by di digestive dysfunction, malfunctioning. We're talking about this on the Bright Side on my radio program, which you can check out. It's on every day uh, if you just Google pharmacist Ben in the Bright Side. Uh, when the digestive system starts to break down, leaky gut, for example, and there's a lot of causes of leaky gut, gluten intolerance, other intolerances to foods, uh, eating a lot of fatty, of fried fats or processed fats can also cause leaky gut. When the, uh, gut leak, when the gut becomes leaky, the intestine, when we say gut, by the way, we mean the intestine. When the intestine becomes leaky, toxins can enter into the bloodstream. When toxins ent enter into the bloodstream, they can initiate immune responses that can ultimately affect the various organs and glands. That's what autoimmunity really is. Also, food particles that leak into the bloodstream can also uh, induce an immune response. Food particles look like organs and glands. Think about it, the peptides in foods are almost, are, are exactly the same as the peptides in our organs and glands. Our organs and glands are like food. They're a type of food. And when you think about it, they're made of the same things that foods are made of. So in any case, when things get into the bloodstream through the intestine, that can induce an autoimmune response. When it happens in the thyroid, something very interesting happens. So you get these toxins that go into the bloodstream, initiating an immune response in the thyroid because the thyroid regulates the digestive system now your digestive system is going to be further compromised more stuff is going to get in more stuff is going to get into the bloodstream further suppressing the thyroid further suppressing digestive function further suppressing the thyroid and you get this vicious downward spiral that's one of the really severe problems with Hashimoto's thyroiditis is it can tumble out of control and affect every other system in the body eventually and ultimately ultimately lead to almost every single cause of or every single chronic degenerative disease you can name including the biggies cancer and heart disease the things we die from all right so let's see here i hope that helps Dawn Marie. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Well, you know your stuff, Shoshana, that's for sure. How do you know? Uh, oh, how do you know by your skin? Kristen says, how do you know by your skin if you have leaky gut? If you have sensitive skin, chances are good you have leaky gut. If you have melasma, chances are good you have leaky gut. If you have any inflammatory skin condition, including psoriasis, dermatitis, eczema, and acne, the chances are good you have leaky gut. If you have a digestive problem, if you bloat after certain foods, if you uh, feel really fatigued after you eat certain foods, if you break out uh, in rashes or dermatitis or pimples after you have eat certain foods, again, you can pretty much assume that you have a problem with leaky gut. Almost everybody, the way we eat, if you're, if you're subsisting on the standard American diet, almost everybody, by the time they reach their 40s and 50s, is going to have some degree of leaky gut. So it's best to just assume that you have it. If you have any skin condition or any digestive health condition or digestive discomfort or even constipation or loose stools, 
pretty much you can rest assured you have uh, leaky gut. And, and it's just a good assumption to make the way the standard American diet is and the way most of us live our lives. Robert bought 12 bottles of NAC. Good job, Robert. Where'd you get it? Will you put a message, put a, uh, in, the, in the message box, tell us where you got the NAC so other people can get it. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that. I'll be on Coast to Coast here in a couple of weeks. Just got AM, PM set. Ah, good question. Maru, uh, Maru is that Marv or? I can't read that. Marv or Maru, I can't see. Uh, at, says, uh, just got the AM, PM set and wondering how to layer them. All right, here's, I'm glad you brought that up. Layering is not a thing. There's no such thing. When you put a product on your skin and then you put an, pro, a, another product on the skin, those two products don't stay in layers. They mix up. It's not like one layer is discrete from the other layer. It's, that's not a really, really a thing. It's much better to blend your products together in your hand and then apply them together on your skin. There's no such thing as layering. Uh, I know you hear a lot about layering products, but that doesn't really happen. When you put one product on and then another one after that, it's not like they stay in discrete layers. So layering is not a thing. I much prefer people, I suggest people put product in their hand, blend it together so you get a nice uniform blend of your two or your three products. And by the way, Truth Treatments are designed to be blended that way. Truth Transdermal C Serum with Mineral Mist with Omega-6 Healing Cream. Retinol with Omega-6 Healing Cream is an awesome blend. Retinol with Truth Transdermal, uh, Transdermal C Balm is an awesome blend. So when you blend the products in your hand before you put them on your skin, you get a, a uniform combining of the product. It's much more a much more effective way to apply product. Shoshana, if foods like cauliflower, Brussels sprouts are difficult to digest. Ah, good question. They are sometimes difficult for people to digest. Number one, use cellulase, which is a digestive enzyme that helps you break up cellulose. The fiber in vegetables can sometimes be hard for people to process. Also, steaming your veggies can help loosen or, uh, or make them, soften them, make them easier for the body to process. Slightly steaming your cauliflower, cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. In fact, steaming in general is a great way to release nutrients from certain vegetables and it will also, steaming and even braising, will release sugars from certain vegetables. So they'll actually taste less bitter and even a little sweet in the case of onions and other vegetables. So uh, steaming is the best thing you can do and also cellulase enzymes. Uh, uh, apple cider vinegar can sometimes help too. Are photoestrogen and photoprogesterone safe? I don't know what photoestrogen, uh, you'll have to help me with that. I don't know what uh, Army says. Are photoestrogen, I'm not sure what you mean by photoestrogen and photoprogesterone. I've never really heard of that. Safe and topical products. Progesterone is incredibly safe and in topical products. Estrogen, you gotta be a little bit careful with uh, simply because estrogen is such a potent hormone. When I was compounding estrogen creams, in my compounding pharmacy, I would have to be really careful because if I was off by even a microgram, which is a, like a pinhead amount of estrogen, a patient would come back either depressed or constipated or, or, or anxious or, or uh, with weight gain because just the tiniest amount of estrogen can throw off a biochemistry of, or of exogenous or outside the body estrogen like in a cream. You don't have to worry about that with progesterone. Uh, Omega-6 Healing Cream, Denise says she just got it. Good to know, thank you. Ba -ba -dum -ba. Yeah, organ meats are great, Megan. Wow, I got lots of stuff here. Nobody's asking questions. Thank you so much, Irene, I appreciate that. Um, I'm concerned organ, ah, good. Linda says she's concerned organ meats will aggravate gout. Gout is a sugar problem. Gout is associated, especially fructose, by the way, fruit sugar. Gout is associated with sugar and sh uh, 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 fruit sugar and glucose, blood glucose. That's the most important reason why you will have gout. Now, high protein foods can sometimes do it, and Linda is pointing out that organ meats would aggravate the gout. Go on a low carb diet, number one, and use small amounts of organ meats if you're concerned about gout. Uh, but most importantly, when it comes to gout, it's a sugar problem and uh, particularly a fructose problem, fruit sugar problem, and high fructose corn syrup, of course. Uh, that's another place where we get lots and lots of fructose. Christine says, can we supplement other skincare on top of vitamin C serum? Yeah, Christine, you can use whatever you want on top of our, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you're, you mean on top of Truth Treatments, but I don't recommend that you do. Truth, treatment, truth Treatments have everything that you need in them, but if you wanted to put other products on top of them or with them, uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't. I don't know, I can't really say just generically because I need to know what was in those other products, but theoretically speaking, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to mix other products with truth treatments, but you don't need to.
because two treatments have everything you need. Uh, ah, yes, good point. Carolyn says no cruciferous for people with thyroid matter uh, with thyroid matters. I assume you mean hypothyroidism. There is some. There are some people who will tell you that cruciferous vegetables are goitrogens. That is, they will induce goiters. The likelihood of that is so slim, it's almost impossible. Now, theoretically, there are some things in cruciferous vegetables that can act like goitrogens, but there's such, there's so, in such little low concentration in these cruciferous vegetables, much more important to focus on the stress response, to focus on cortisol and estrogen, to focus on digestive health in the case of Hashimoto's. There's much, you have much bigger fish to fry, not to mention the fact that the cruciferous vegetables are incredibly medicinal. If you are concerned about the cruciferous vegetables in your hypothyroid, about the goitrogenic effect, steam them, and steaming your cruciferous vegetables should get rid of any potential goitrogens. But it's really not, I don't consider that to be a big deal. Uh, now, estrogenic foods, like soy in particular, that, those may be a problem, but again, uh, if, you, if you ferment your soy or you process, you use fresh soy and then steam it, soybeans and steam them like um, uh, edamame, for example, uh, you probably won't run into that, uh, into that much of a, uh, that significant a phytoestrogen issue. And then also some people believe, and I tend to believe this too, that the phytoestrogens in plants can actually be protective against the more toxic estrogens, the stronger or more potent estrogens that the body produces. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Let's see here. I work with black esthetician or skincare from Korea. She says that black skin is different. Yes, indeed. That is absolutely correct. Black skin is strong, uh, is thicker, stronger, uh, can be more oily. And that is true. Black skin is very, very powerful skin. It's very robust, strong skin. Uh, I'm not sure how that refers, refers back to your question. Uh, but that is a good point, and that's totally accurate. Black skin is thicker. I love working with black skin uh, because black skin is much more forgiving, much more robust. You can do a lot more work with black skin. Uh, if you're in the middle, however, of the Fitzpatrick scale where you're not like like super dark black, maybe kind of cocoa black or, or uh, cafe mocha black, mocha black, those are the people who will hyperpigment. So you do have to be a little bit more careful if somebody is has diabetes, insulin resistant, all the things we talked about earlier, estrogen problems, have digestive problems. Those are the folks who are gonna hyperpigment, so you do have to be a little bit careful. Uh, I sprayed the biomimetic mineral mist, true serum in my hand and massaged it. And you know, I can't, for some reason, I can't see the end of these long questions, unfortunately, so I'm not sure what you're asking me there. Don't think the thyroid and adrenal can kill you. Mother die from low blood sodium levels. Yes, by the way, salt cravings, and adrenal health issues go hand in hand. The adrenal glands process salt. And by the way, despite these, this, uh, all the noise you hear about low salt diets, salt, that is sodium chloride, when I say salt, I'm talking about sodium and chloride. Um, sodium chloride and chloride are very important for the, helping the body handle stress. The more stress you're under, the more you're gonna be burning through sodium and chloride, and the more salt you're going to need. So it's much more important that you focus on getting enough salt, good quality salt, by the way, not just sodium and chloride, but Celtic sea salt, which has all of your elements in it, uh, or Himalayan salt, which has all of your elements in it, than to worry about a low salt diet. Uh, if you have high blood pressure, it's not a salt problem. If you have high blood pressure, you more than likely have a stress problem, a cortisol problem. And ironically, if you have a stress problem that's leading to high blood pressure, you may actually need more salt than to be on a low salt diet. I know that's very controversial, and there's probably some medical professionals out there that would probably think I'm crazy for saying that, but there's a lot of really good literature that talks about it, and the biochemistry makes perfect sense because salt is a major part of the stress response. If you find yourself, by the way, craving salt, try drinking Celtic sea salt in water. In fact, try it first thing in the morning. If you wake up in the morning fatigued, or if you find yourself craving salt in the middle of the day, try a little bit of Celtic sea salt in water and sip on your Celtic sea salt water. You'll find that you have more energy and you'll find, especially this is really important, you'll be craving salty foods like pizza and pretzels and potato chips and all the crappy salty food that tends to be processed much less. So uh, kind of proactively hack into your salt cravings by using quality salt, Celtic sea salt, or Himalayan salt, and not only will you be able to hack into your cravings, but you'll also, uh, you'll also have, be able to handle stress a little bit more effectively. All right, let's see here. Uh, hormone replacement, Danae says, do I recommend hormone replacement? It's a very slippery slope. 
You, some people feel better when they're on hormone replacement. If you are gonna do hormone replacement, make sure that you're working on detoxifying your hormones, particularly estrogen. Most hormone replacement is estrogen, although men these days will, will use testosterone replacement. Testosterone is not quite as dangerous as estrogen. Estrogen is the most dangerous of all the hormones uh, because of these catechol estrogens that I talked about earlier. Um, if you are gonna use hormone replacement therapy, make sure you're supporting your liver's ability to process that estrogen using supplements like essential fatty acids, the B vitamins, magnesium, and something called calcium D-glucurate, calcium D-glucurate, and also um, your cruciferous vegetables, and make sure your bowel movements, make sure you're going to the bathroom regularly because estrogen is processed through, uh, is uh, eliminated through the body through the bowels. Uh, don't think the thyroid, yeah, you know, for some reason I can't, oh, there it is. Low blood and it went downhill from there. Yeah, you're right. That's absolutely true. Uh, uh, Robert says, don't think the thyroid and adrenal complex problems can't kill you. Yes, they can, absolutely. In fact, like I say, all health challenges are associated, all chronic health challenges are associated with a poorly functioning thyroid. There's no, you don't have to have your thyroid checked. You can assume that if you have an autoimmune disease or you have some kind of uh, 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 chronic degenerative health challenge like osteoporosis or diabetes, you can rest assured you've got a thyroid problem. You don't need to have your thyroid checked. Just act as if you had a thyroid problem and support thyroid health. And by the way, Synthroid is not a great strategy for supporting thyroid health. Synthroid is artificial thyroid hormone, but it's not going to uh, fix a messed up thyroid. Best strategy for fixing your thyroid is work on your digestive system and calm the body down and stabilize your blood sugar. Um, Maru, spray biomimetic mist on my face and then mix vitamin C serum. Yes, that's a great blend, I love that. Remember, all my all uh, true treatments are designed to be blended. I formulated them to be blended. Doug says he had high blood pressure, started doing intermittent fasting and keto, feel much, use salt a lot, good for you. All right, I think that's it. That was a long, that's a long Facebook, you guys. Thanks for sticking with me. Thank you for being such loyal truthers. I appreciate and love all you guys. Uh, desiccated thyroid uh, is just fake thyroid. It's just thyroid gland, uh, Dawn. It's a little bit, probably a little bit better than Synthroid, but it's not gonna fix your thyroid. It's going to replace thyroid hormone, but it's not gonna fix the thyroid. All right, I gotta motivate. Thanks so much, guys. We'll do another Facebook Live. If you have any ideas, send a, a, a note to support at truthtreatments.com if you have any ideas for, uh, for topics for these Facebook Lives. And let me see, what's something else I was gonna tell you? We'll do one next week. I'm not sure what we'll talk about next week. Hope that was helpful. We'll post this on YouTube. And I love all you guys, and I appreciate you all very, very much. Thanks. Talk to you later. Bye.